Right. So actually, let me uh, let me touch on a point that I um, so I had this proposition, which I said was a corrected version of Lott and Villani's four point one, and it said if I have a map between two metric spaces, which is an R isometry, an isometry up to scale R. Um, of compact spaces. Though I'm not even sure that it matters, um, the compactness. Then the push forward uh, acts as an R isometry, or maybe a seven R isometry between probability measures on X and probability measures on Y when you put the two Wasserstein metric on them. And in the middle of the proof, so uh, what I managed to prove last class was that um, um, whenever I take two measures on the first space, probability measures, um, and I look at the two Wasserstein distance in the second space between their images under F, um, then that's controlled by uh, the distance between them plus the error term R. So I got that far. And then I sort of, I sort of couldn't understand where I'd gotten this seven R from. Um, and uh, what I forgot was that when I, so let's, of course we can take the square root and eliminate the square roots from here. But um, this gives an upper bound, but um, to be an R isometry, we also need a lower bound. We would also like this to be bigger than this minus something. And that's where we get the seven R from. And so, um, so, um, and basically where that comes from is, um, you apply the same argument, but you apply. So we we said that F has these approximate inverses, which if F is our, our recall, F tilde from Y to X is uh, the approximate inverse that we constructed last class. Is a three R isometry. And so if I, um, to get the lower bound that I need, um, I'm going to apply the approximate inverse to these guys and the same argument as before. And that then it tells me that the D2X of F tilde push forward, F push forward, U naught, F tilde push forward, F push forward mu one, by the same argument as above uh, has to be less than dy because f tilde is a three R isometry. And um, of course, of course, then I still I still need to relate this guy here to this. But um, but um, sorry, um, that's not what I wanted. Um, If I look at F tilde composed with F acting on one of them, uh, let's say for either one, let's say mu naught. Um, this guy here is a two R isometry between, sorry, um, F tilde composed F is a map from X to X and it's a two R isometry. And so this by the same argument is the, less than the distance between mu naught and mu naught plus two R. And so finally, 
I have the, the two distance between mu naught and mu one using the triangle inequality twice is less than the two distance between mu naught f tilde composed with f mu naught plus uh, this is an x distance. This is now I think a, uh, uh, um, an x distance again f tilde composed with f push forward uh, mu naught f tilde composed with f push forward mu one plus a term a symmetrical term to this one um, and now I've got I've got this upper bound for the middle term here and I've got a bound like this, a bound like this for both the first and the last term. And so when I add those things together, I get 7r plus distance y. And that's that's the lower bound for this quantity that we needed. Okay. Right. And then I was in the middle of proving a theorem. And um, all that, that this, this is the stability uh, theorem. Maybe I'll call it stability one or stability for compact CD spaces. Um, and basically it said, if I have a triple XJ, DJ, MJ, which is Gromo, uh, which is in um, CDKN, if I have a sequence of triples and compact, um, and XJ, DJ, MJ converges in the measured gromov hausdorff sense to a limit space, also uh, compact. Sometimes I'll write XDM and sometimes I'll write X infinity, D infinity, M infinity. Um, and the sequence of spaces belong to CD KN. And here K is real and N can be between one and infinity. Then the limiting space is the same. Uh, and let me add an extra little hypothesis um, that uh, I, I don't think Filani states this, but um, I was only able to verify his proof under this extra hypothesis. And I kind of think the hypothesis is necessary for reasons that maybe I'm going to say later. Um, so, So I didn't have this last time. Questions about the statement? Yeah. No. So, uh, I mean, the statement is just written strange. Just the same thing is written twice? Or am I reading something wrong? So if, what do you mean things, the... if these things are CDKN and- Oh yeah, sorry, yeah, you're right, you're right. I wrote it twice. <laughs> I was maybe missing an index. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, so, uh, so you're absolutely right, and thank you for pointing it out. Um, so this is redundant. Other questions? Um, and so, um, th so that I had, I kind of sketched. I started to sketch this proof. And uh, maybe I recall it. The proof went the following way. It said, um, 
So let's start with um, a measure mu naught and mu one in the limiting space. And then I said, um, I said, let's for, for first round, let's assume that um, for the, both of these guys have continuous densities. Uh, And because that's that's going to help the proof a little bit. And then the idea, oh yes, um, because I have this this measured gromov hausdorff convergence, what the measured gromov hausdorff convergence means is that I can find um, a set of approximate isometries f j taking x j into x uh, epsilon j isometries with epsilon going to zero as j goes to infinity and also um also fj push forward uh mj is going to converge in the weak sense to m infinity that's what it meant to have this measured gromov hausdorff convergence and so I'm going to use these FJs to define um, for I equals zero and one to define the sort of approximations to these in the Jth approximating space. So define um, rho J to be um, Row J zero to be row zero composed with FJ and row J one to be row one composed with FJ. Now, of course, these won't be continuous because the FJs are not continuous um, necessarily. But um, and mu J zero to be. Uh, Rho j zero dmj and similarly uh, at time one. And then because I have the this this redundant hypothesis that I wrote twice, um, I have a geodesic in um, so since x dm is cdkn. There exists these approximating geodesics mu j t and we showed last class that um, when you have uh, when you have a Gromov Hausdorff of limitive spaces and you have a sequence of geodesics in those spaces, then they will converge uh, uniformly. To a limiting geodesics. And of course, oh, yes, yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, um, so wait, wait a second, we have a little problem, which is that so far these things are not probability measures, but if I divide them by so I have to normalize by Z0J and Z1J, where, um, where Z0J, for example, is basically the integral um, over XJ of rho naught composed with FJ dmj, which is the same thing as integrating Uh, rho naught over x infinity against um, the push forward of fj of mj, mj under fj, and since these things are weakly converging and rho naught is continuous, this converges to one as j goes to infinity. 
and in particular it's positive for a large J. And so then, then these are now with, with these normalizations, these are probability measures. And so then, then, I, can, uh, then I can do this. Uh, ba, 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 ba. And of course, um, I don't really mean there are geodesics in XJ. I mean there are geodesics in, I better erase that. There are geodesics in the probability measures on XJ metrized by two Wasserstein distance. And then this thing will be a geodesic in the probability measures on X infinity metrized by Wasserstein distance. Great. And the other thing that we know uh, because of this CD can and tropic can condition is that, uh, well, I, uh, there were, so there were two things. Uh, there are two things to do, but. Um, so we know that, um, we also know that if I define the jth entropy at time T to be the Boltzmann entropy of mu j t with respect to mu j um then that's going to be a kn convex function or it, rather k will be weighted by the the two distance between mu not j and mu one j squared And I should have said this is convergence of a subsequence because it was a compactness result. And now there's a couple of cases. So, and I was starting to discuss the case n equals infinity. And what, what this kn convexity means when n is infinity is it just means that ej of t is less than one minus t ej of zero plus t ej of one minus kt one minus t over two um and then this factor here distance squared uj one j squared and so basically what i wanted to do was pass to the limit i'd like to pass to the limit in this inequality when n equals infinity that's about where i was and so um and recall that um S of mu, I don't know, it doesn't matter, mu t, let's say mu t m is the integral of, I'm going to call it a, um, I think I called it u last class, but let me call it a today, um, a of rho t dm, where uh, Rho t is the um, the red on Nikonheim derivative, and a is rho log rho, uh, which is convex, like that, as a function of rho. Okay. So so the, so and what I claim I said I have several claims that I needed to verify last class, and so the claims were that. Um, that ej0 converges to e infinity 0 by our construction, or by the fact that we had continuous densities. And um, on the other hand, e infinity of t is less than or equal to the limit along our subsequence of um, of ejt and um and then i also and i also need to worry about the distance but uh i'm in good shape with this distance but uh because so um so i guess these are the three things i need um
So if I have all these three, um, maybe I should call them A, B, and C. If A, B, and C are all true, then I can pass to the limit in this inequality here and get, um, if so, then in the limit I'll get E infinity T is less than or equal to one minus T E infinity zero. And this is along our sub, our, it was along our preferred subsequence where, um, where the geodesic joining these guys converges to the geodesic joining these guys uniformly in T. Um, right, is everyone with me? Any questions? Okay, so I still have to... What, what was it? Second e infinity should be an e infinity zero, or sorry, an e infinity of one. Oh uh, yes, that's right. Thank you. No worries. Okay, that's basically what I need. Um, <clears throat> and so I guess point. Um, well, okay, so I was sloppy a little bit. Um, so what we actually proved last class was uniform convergence of a subsequence of um, F J push forward nu T J. to this guy and it's it's uniform in T, but of course the metric that I'm using to measure convergence is, um, so IE. So what, what's really going on is that the limit as J goes to infinity of the two Wasserstein distance between these push forwards uh, and maybe I should uh, of the soup uh, T and zero one of the two Wasserstein distance between the jth push forward of mu tj, sorry, mu tj, and the mu infinity uh, t is zero. And that's, um, a, this is again a subsequential limit and I'm not gonna relabel it. Um, okay, so these guys are going to zero but the fj's are epsilon j identities and the epsilon j's are going to zero. And so, um, so because the epsilon j's are going to zero and the fj are epsilon j's identities, this guy here is getting closer and closer um, uh, buh, 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 buh. What do I want to say? Okay, so so for part C, the epsilon j's are going to zero. And so the distance between mu, that's maybe not the right thing to say. Um, oh yes, the distance between mu naught j and mu one j is getting closer and closer to the distance. The, of course, this is in xj and this is in uh, x infinity, but the distance between these push forwards. Right, that's less than epsilon j and that's going to zero. So these distance here are getting closer and closer to these distances. Um, this guy here is getting closer and closer to that, and this guy's getting closer and closer to this, and so I have C. So that's part C. And I also, uh, I should talk about part A. So, um, so for part A, the epsilon j of zero, well, that's the integral over xj of 
a of, uh, I guess, rho zero j, uh, rho zero rather composed with f j over z zero j um, integrated against m j. But that's also the integral over x infinity of a of rho zero over z zero j um, d f j push forward m j. And because rho zero is continuous and a is continuous, I'm integrating a continuous function against the sequence of measures. And the, these measures are converging weakly. So in, uh, along the subsequence, they're converging weakly. So they, uh, so I get, so this goes as j goes to infinity to um, a of rho naught dm as j goes to infinity by the weak convergence of these measures. And that's E zero or E infinity zero. That's what, just what we wanted. And it works the same at time one because we use the same construction at time one. And then finally, um, for part B, the lower semi-continuity, um, I think we more or less proved this last class, um, but um, so so here e j t is. Uh, well, it's it's S of mu t j relative to m j, and uh, oh, we showed that S was jointly weakly lower semi continuous. So we will have this if, um, if m j is converging weakly to m. And oh yeah, sorry, sorry, no, this this is not quite right yet. So e j is that, and this is bigger than. Um, S of FJ push forward. If I apply F to both sides, we showed last class that um, the entropy goes down when I look at the image of any of these measures along the same the same mapping. So in particular, this epsilon J isometry. And um, and now now we showed that F. S is uh, lower semi-continuous, so therefore the limb inf of the EJs will be bigger than the limb inf of the SJ push forward mu TJ, FJ push forward mu J. And as long as both factors are converging um, to the respective limits, so hopefully this is converging to mu T infinity, and that's converging to M in the weak sense. So this was the convergence of this in the weak sense was part of the definition of, um, I used it up here. It was part of the definition of the measured gromov hausdorff convergence. And the convergence of this thing along our subsequence to this limit, um, that was because that we had uniformly in T that the two Wasserstein distance uh, between FJ push forward uh, every point on the geodesic to the limit. And so because D2 is is the metric of weak convergence. We also have this converging weakly to that. And so that's um, that's point B. Okay, and so now we've, we've completed the proof of the claim. And so we've completed the proof of the theorem modulo, uh, modulo the fact that we assumed we made the simplifying hypothesis 
that the we were going to start out with measures that had continuous density. So modulo this um, this simplifying hypothesis here, we've completed the proof of the theorem. And so the remaining step is to show that this simplifying hypothesis doesn't cost any generality. Um, in other words, if I have arbitrary um, on this compactly supported space, if I have arbitrary measures, I want to be able to approximate them with measures that have continuous densities um, so that the entropy of the approximants, the limb soup of the entropy of the approximates is no bigger than the entropy of the limit, the thing I'm trying to approximate. So, any nu naught u1 in the limiting space. And I might as well assume they have finite entropy. Um, uh, admit approximations uh, let's say let's say mu i zero um, and I think um such that the entropy of the limit is at least as large, that's why I can assume finite entropy, as let's say the limb soup uh, i going to infinity of the entropy, sorry, um, and again, this is, this is all with respect to the same reference measure, so I won't write it. Um, I think that's the main step that I still have to show because if I can do that, then um, then um, so then what I'll know is that um, by by the preceding oh yes having continuous densities. So then by the previous step. I will know that the entropy, oh yeah, sorry. Uh, so there's two things that remain to show. Uh, yeah, I, I need to do this. And I also haven't addressed the case K finite yet. Um, so, so I, since I started talking about this, I'll say a bit more, but then I'll let me probably turn to K finite and come back to this point. Because then what will happen, well, uh, by the previous step, I'll have shown that mu, um, the mu, Ti would be less than one minus T entropy um, mu zero I minus whatever the usual term here. And then, um, then if I, if I have this approximation, then I can pass the limit I going to infinity. And um, these terms are, can only go up. And this term we already know is a lower semi-continuous function of this. So when I pass to I infinity, because this is weak convergence, I get, um, I'll get S of mu T um, will be less than one minus T S of mu zero plus T S of mu one. And if both, if this is, happening if the same kind of approximation is happening both times zero and time one then this is going to converge by the triangle inequality to um right so this is the key 
Um, and let me also be now let me let me actually before I show that I can do this approximation in respecting the entropy and this is supposed to remind you very much of the gamma convergence question on the current homework set. Um, where we have we were using a kind of limb soup inequality a lower semi continuity at the intermediate times and we're using the construction of a sequence of nice approximants at the endpoint times. Um, okay, so what happens when n is finite then. Um, so let me go back to the previous proof when n is finite. So then recall that if I set, um, if I set, let me let me set little u of t to be capital U of n of um, and I guess there's a j here mu jt, which by definition is the exponential of minus one over n of um, the relative entropy. Um, and recall the, the kn convexity of s is equivalent to a convexity statement, a, a weighted convexity statement of uj. Which said that uj at the intermediate times is less than sigma k over n, one minus t of the Wasserstein distance between the endpoints. Uh, Uh, uj0 plus uh, the corresponding term at time t, uh, the corresponding Wasserstein distance, um, uj1. And it was, sorry, it's a concavity statement. So I've gotten the inequality backwards. And that this, this kind of statement is equivalent to the, to the space the case space having curvature dimension parameters capital K and capital N. And so basically in order to prove that the limiting space has the same curvature dimension parameters, I need to show that I can take the limit J goes to infinity in this kind of inequality here. And um, so because of the minus sign here, um, any kind of monotonicity that I had for S before gets reversed at the level of U. And so um, point A of my, well, we had convergence under point A. So A of my hypothesis space is because, because U is a continuous function of S, uh, point A of my claim shows that this is gonna go to the limiting U infinity of zero, and this is gonna go to U infinity of one. And point C of my claim shows that this distance converges to the distance between nu naught and nu one, the limiting guys. And these coefficients were continuous, if you remember what they were. They were the solutions to a little second order ODE or maybe ratios of those guys. Um, so this is by C of my claim. And then B of my claim said that this behaved lower semi-continuously with respect to J. And so the minus sign here, this is gonna behave upper semi-continuously. And so indeed I'll get U infinity of T is bigger than. Okay. So that should be the end of the proof. Modulo, modulo this remaining to show that I can approximate arbitrary guys that have finite entropy weakly with um, guys having continuous densities such that the entropy of the approximants is smaller than the entropy of the limiting guy. And so uh, I don't know, let's call this lemma or whatever. This is like an approximation lemma or proposition. Okay, so I have to prove that proposition. And the, um, the if we were doing this in Euclidean space, um, the idea would be mollification. So in other words, I take some probability measure, I do an epsilon mollification, 
Now it's sudden, it might have been just now one density before, or even a measure before. When I epsilon mollify it, I suddenly make it. I suddenly give it a smooth density. And the other observation is that um, is basically a Jensen a Jensen's inequality observation, which is that when you because the a defining s the integrand this a here is convex when you mollify the entry you lower the entropy you're doing an average convex conve convex the averages have low uh, when you apply a, a convex function to an average you get something lower than if you average the values of the convex function and so jensen's inequality tells us that something like mollifying is going to lower the, the entropy so the proposition proved by mollification and Jensen's inequality. Uh, but we're, we're in a arbitrary metric space here, or maybe Polish space. Um, so um, although it's compact, so that, that there was this compactness hypothesis. And so in we need some kind of version of mollification that's going to work on a compact metric space. And I have notes on this somewhere, how to do this mollification. So let me try to find my notes because I'm sure that it will go smoother if I do it from notes. Yeah, okay, right, great. Um, here we go. Except my notes are not as complete as I would like them to be. Uh, yeah, no. Come on. All right, let me see. Uh, let me, I can find it on the computer. Um, okay. Yeah, here we go. Um, right, okay, great, great, great. So, so before I prove the proposition, I need to prove a lemma. And here's the lemma. Um, So I'm going to assume I have a it's slightly more general, but not much more general. Um, if I have a boundedly compact metric space and a compact subset, um, oh shoot. The, the, the lemma wants a definition. So let me let me say what the definition is. Um, so this is fine. So this is actually going to be basically definition. And I, I give a reference. Um, this is more or less definition 29.34 from Villani's book. Um, and I think he calls these regularizing kernels. Um, so he says, a Y M so M here is supposed to be a rat on measure. So finite on compact subsets, a Y M regularizing kernel is a family parameterized by uh, positive numbers and they should be um, continuous functions on the metric space times itself 
with three properties. Um, so they're going to be symmetric, kr of xy is kr of yx, and non-negative. And they should be very local. So they should vanish far away from the diagonal, and r measures how far away. So uh, whenever the distance between x and y is bigger than r, then the value of the kernel should be 0. And finally, they should be normalized so that the if I integrate out over one of the variables, it doesn't matter which one by symmetry, I get one. So that's what's meant by a regularizing kernel. And of course, when you have such a kernel, it induces a, a family of linear operators um, on measures. We don't ask any kind of continuity. Oh uh, yeah, uh, continuous. Ah, sorry, I didn't see. Sorry. Yeah. So on sign measures of finite total variation, uh, and also on densities. So the sign measure could be a density with respect to the reference measure. So what does KR of mu mean? Uh, it's going to be a continuous function of x, and it's defined to be the integral over x of KR of x, y, d mu y. And similarly, if, if I wanted to apply KR to an L1 density, um, it would just be an integral against that density in the reference measure. Sorry, I could have I could have written it in the other order. And then, um, so the lemma that I wanted to state is that um, there's two parts of the lemma. First of all. For any boundedly compact space, such an object exists. I wasn't too careful. Um, I should have said the normalization holds for every x in y. So probably the probably we want these properties for all x, y, and x, but uh, but we only want this normalization when uh, when when this variable is in y, and that's how it depends on the compact subset y. Okay. Um, So first of all, such things exist. And secondly, um, the linear operator which takes measures to continuous functions um, satisfies the following properties. If if you have if you start out with a continuous function, then the limit as r goes to zero, this, this, these properties are basically what motivate the definition of regularizing kernel. Um, And if you just started out with a measure, I've already implicitly said the function that you get is continuous. Um, then a couple of things happen. Uh, but one of them is that the total variation 
those can only go down. And you have equality if uh, if mu is positive. And also, the you get weak approximations. So d2x of mu kr mu goes to zero as r goes to zero. And finally, um, if you have an L1 density, then kr converts it to a continuous function, which approximates it in L1. So let me address part one of the lemma two and then address part two. Uh, so I'm given some R for each R bigger than zero, I need to define such a regularizing kernel and I'm gonna use the compactness of Y. So cover Y by finitely many R over two balls. So diameter are our balls. And then what we need to know is that there's a partition of unity for set, which uh, you know follows from these T1, T2, T3, T3, T3 and T4 axioms of topology um, for compact spaces we have T4. Um, so let phi i, um, these should be continuous functions taking x into zero one be a subordinate partition of unity. That's how we're going to localize. And what it means to be a subordinate partition of unity is on the one hand, when I add these up over the finitely many balls, I get y, and on the other hand, um, phi is going to vanish unless some, um, unless x is in the ith ball. So I should have called these br over two of xi, i counting from one to n. Okay. Um, and then basically once I have such a partition of unity, I have no trouble defining K. So K of R X Y is going to be defined to be the sum on I of phi I X phi I Y. And then I have to normalize it to get what I wanted. Um, so you can see it's symmetric under interchange of X and Y. You can see that, um, that when I integrate out the Y variable with respect to, uh, to M, this term is gonna cancel with the denominator and I'll be left with the sum and the sums add up to one on Y. So I have, the, I have, the, um, I have this normalization that I wanted on Y. And, uh, oh yes, and you can see that if X and Y are further than just, the only way that K is non-zero is, um, is that both X and Y lie in the, um, is that for some I, both X and Y have to lie in the ith ball, which means that they're at maximum separation are from each other. So that's the, that's basically the proof of part one. And now for part two, when we want to talk about properties of this regularizing kernel, which these, these don't re rely on this, they, they only rely on, the, defi on the, the definition of a regularizing kernel, not on the specific choice of regularizing kernel. So when I want to do part 2a, um, basically if r is small enough, 
So given epsilon, given epsilon positive, because I'm on a compact space, um, if I have and I have a continuous function, um, there exists R small enough such that um, x minus y less than R will imply fx minus fy is less than epsilon because continuous functions on compact spaces are uniformly continuous. And in that case, when I compare f of x to its regularization, um, well, the regularization is defined by some integral and I can write f of x as the, because of the, um, the normalization property of KR, uh, at least for, for x and y, um, I can write f of x, this integrates to one, so I can, I can bring f inside the integral and the regularized value is this. And um, so if I put absolute values on this, then bring the absolute values inside, this difference is less than epsilon. So I get, this is less than epsilon integral x k r x y dm y. And for x and y, this integrates to one. So indeed, um, indeed, I have uniform convergence of this guy to that guy. So that's property A as R goes to zero. If I wanna look at property B, since epsilon was arbitrary, I have uniform convergence. Um, basically property B is I'm wanting to show that um, KR of mu converges weakly. Well, one of the things I'm wanting to show is that KR of mu converges weakly to mu as R goes to zero and uh, a simple way of doing that is to um, look at the action. So measures are defined in duality with their action on continuous functions. But um, so recall uh, so the action of mu, at mu on a continuous function of f is basically the integral of f to mu. Um, given any continuous function, any continuous function on convex space is bounded. And um, so KR mu of F is basically um, gonna be a double integral of F of X KR X Y uh, D mu of, y dm of x, I guess. This should have been uh, dm of x, yes. Um, and now if I use Fubini, then that's the integral of fr y d mu of y. And we just argued that uh, these guys are converging uniformly. So um, as r goes to zero, so this, this converges to integral f d mu. And so for any continuous function, the actual, the action of k r mu on f converges to integral f d mu as R goes to zero, and that's basically the definition of weak convergence. Now, the other part of B was that when I have a measure, uh, the, the total mass of the measure doesn't, if the measure is non-negative, if mu is non-negative, then when I regularize it, And then if I integrate that over X,
um, at least if support mu is contained in Y, then um, again by Fubini, I can interchange the order of integration. And when I integrate this with respect to M, I get one and um, And so I haven't lost any maths. So that's the preservation of total variation, at least for measures supported in Y, which is I think where we want it. And then basically, if if mu is not if mu is not non-negative, when you do this kind of intro, we can get cancellations, and so the total variation goes down. And then the final the the point C was that when I have a density, oh yes. Um, when I have, it was basically that if you have F in L1, um, then KRF minus F L1 goes to zero as R goes to zero. Uh, let me see. Oh yes, yes, yes. Um, so basically, um, follows from A, and the fact that if you close, if you take the continuous functions and you close them in L one, you get L one. So it follows from density of the continuous functions. So, so this this is obviously true for continuous functions by part A because. Um, well, basically, the expression we use to um, to show part A, um, if I wanted to put an L, if I wanted to put an L one norm on, well, I have it, I have it going to zero and L infinity, so it also goes to zero and L one, because L one is less than L infinity on a on a finite measure space, is a weaker norm, and um, and then the uh, the fact that uh, the continuous functions are dense in L one allows you to pass from continuous functions to L1 functions. Great. OK, so now we are in a good position to complete the proof of the proposition, which was that I can approximate so that entropy doesn't go down. And uh, here we go. So this is now this this what I called the proposition is actually uh, theorem twenty nine ninety part three in Villani. Um, but so let me fix a compact space. With um, a non negative measure. Right on so on Borel sets with uh, finite assigns finite mass to the whole space since it's compact space. And then what do I say? I say any mu, oh, and this is, in fact, this is where I need this, um, this is where I need X with X agreeing with its support, with the support of its reference measure. Sorry, uh, I want this to be the, uh, I want this to be the reference measure. So let me call it M instead of U for consistency with my earlier notation. Um, then any probability measure on X can be um, be weekly or weak star, whatever you want to call it. It's the same thing on a compact space, approximated by a sequence mu k, which is now going to be absolutely continuous uh, with respect to the reference measure, um, having 
d mu k dm continuous. And uh, having the, ent the relative entropy of mu with respect to m dominating the limb soup of the approximants. And with, with the work that we just went through in order to, um, to define uh, these regularizing kernels, things are now very simple. So uh, the proof of this lemma is extremely simple now. As I said, it's Jensen's inequality. So I'm going to just define. Um, so the proof is to mollify mu with a regularizing kernel. So I'm going to define rho r of x to be the integral of krxy in uy. And uh, I'm going to define mu r to be the measure that has density rho, rho with respect to m. And we already checked by part b of the preceding lemma that mu r converges weakly. And also since mu r has a density, it converges in or, in or, or in L1, but I don't, I think I just need the weak convergence is enough. And so I just need the, I just need this inequality here. And I claim that that's Jensen's inequality. So um, apply a row equals row log row. So the convex function to row R. And so I have a of row r of x. Um, well, of course, that's a of integral krxy d mu y. And um, Uh, better I should write this in the form. Better I should write mu in the form row zero of y dm y. And then recall that um, for x in y, which in, in, in this case y equals x, right? So then this, it, which equals the support of m. Um, that this kernel here is a probability measure. And so Jensen's inequality tells me when I apply a convex function, I get something smaller than if I had applied the convex function first. Robert. Yes. Yeah. I think you've covered your mic. Oh. Oh, it's better now. Is it better now? Yep. Thanks. So, um, so basically, the idea is I can bring the A inside. But that's Jensen's inequality and the convexity of A. And then I can integrate, I want to now integrate A against dm. And by Fubini, um, when I integrate this against dmx, I get one. And so this is the this is the entry this is the relative entropy. Uh, this is S of KR of mu relative to M. And this is S of mu relative to M. And since each of these is less than this, then certainly the, the limb soup is less than.
and that's what was desired. Okay, questions? All right. Um, so, so that's basically the story for compact metric spaces. And then uh, Villani has a version of this for boundedly compact metric spaces. And uh, it's actually pretty straightforward to produce the version for boundedly compact. Uh, I'll just state it. Um, so the second stability theorem. Um, basically says if uh, I have a sequence of spaces with curvature dimension parameters k and n, and all the spaces are boundedly compact, with um, pointed uh, measured Grumov Hausdorff limit uh, X DMP, then uh, the limiting space inherits the curvature dimension parameters of the sequence. And um, the only thing, so before proving this theorem, uh, so I, I, let me make a point which I, I didn't uh, appreciate until I studied the proof of this theorem, which is that in, this is Villani's theorem. And Villani defines he defines uh, XDM to be in CD whatever. Of course, he doesn't use the entropic version, but he defines XDM to be in CD code if and only if for every um, for every mu naught and mu one probability measures on X of compact support, the entropy inequality holds. There exists a D2 geodesic. Having the appropriate um, having the appropriate endpoints and convexity properties. Appropriate can convex entropy. Appropriately can convex entropy. Um, and so um, so he doesn't do this, he doesn't, he never tries to define these for these guys with, with uh, non-compact support, and that's simplifying for various reasons. And um, it basically allows the same proof to go through at, because whenever I start with two measures, mu naught and mu one of, bound, of compact support, I can go to a large enough ball to contain the support of both of them around my, my point. And now the geodesic might go outside that ball, but it certainly, the geodesic certainly doesn't go outside a ball of radius two r plus one around P because there's a short going from here to P and to there is shorter than going outside the ball of two radius two R. And so it, as long as I'm only trying to prove to extend these entropic convexity properties um, to geodesics for which the endpoints are compactly supported, I can use exactly the same proof as before. And now the caveat is, um, I again, I should have added this extra condition provided uh, X equals support of new. Um, and basically, uh, why do I need to keep adding this extra condition? Um, so I had this mollification procedure and where I took an arbitrary measure, probability measure, and I mollified it to get a probability measure of uh, with continuous densities. And somehow if I do the mollification inside the supportive measure, then I get a probability measure with continuous densities 
inside the support of the measure. And then I now, now I, but I want to, I, I don't want it to drop to zero discontinuously as I cross the boundary of the support. So maybe what I could do is, and Villani mentions this, I, he, he mentions using the Tietz extension theorem to extend a continuous function over a closed set to a continuous function on the whole space. So maybe I could extend it uh, I don't know. I, I, you know, I haven't thought hard about this, but somehow you'd like to extend it to drop quickly to zero. And now it's not a probability measure anymore. It has slightly more mass than a probability measure. So you'd have to maybe divide it by a constant to make it slightly smaller and then do the argument. And then it would probably work. Probably that's how you get rid of this constraint. Now, I was not so fussed about getting rid of this constraint because, um, oh yes, right. And of course, the other thing that makes it work is that once I'm on these balls of radius 2r plus 1, I'm on a compact space. And so the whole argument of the preceding lemma, the whole argument of the previous proof works because I'm on this compact, this big compact ball in this bigger space. Um, now there's another approach. There's another approach. There's a more recent approach, which allows you to extend this to spaces that are not boundedly compact. To uh, spaces. XDM to Polish spaces, not necessarily boundedly compact. And this is, of course, we check that if you have K, if you have a curvature dimension parameters K and N with a finite N, then you get boundedly compact for free. This is not true when N equals infinity. It's so it's really only of interest. For capital N equals infinity. And um, the extension is from a seven year old paper of Gigli, uh, Mondino, and Savare. And they invent some slightly weaker notion of convergence, which turns out to be equivalent in, in the boundedly compact setting. And maybe it's equivalent under some additional hypotheses. And in the, in the CDKN setting, it's equivalent. It, with finite n anyways. Um, so they um, they introduce what they call pointed measured Gromov convergence. This is a 2015 paper. And so they drop the Hausdorff. And in other words, uh, and th they define it the following way. Um, they say, um, they say X1, D1, M1, P1 is gonna be isometric to X2, D2, M2, P2, if and only if there exists a Polish space there's different ways to define it, but this is the quickest one. XD into which both X1 and X2 embed isometrically. So you have an injection I1 uh, taking X1 into x and i2 taking x2 into x such that uh of course um i guess i1 of p1 has to equal i2 of p2 and uh i1 push forward m1 equals i2 push forward m2 and um Basically, uh, basically, be so I don't ask for anything else. So I basically only ask that the measures coincide under this, uh, under these isometric embeddings, and that more or less, it more or less tells you that the spaces coincide as well. At, at least, um, so that will also imply that the support of mu one is equal to the support of mu two under the embeddings. And you essentially don't care about the rest of the space. And so from the point of view of this kind of, these kind of isomorphic, and so, so similarly, you define the convergence by saying, uh, so similarly, 
um, x, let's say xj, dj, mj, tj converges in the pointed measured Gromov sense, no Hausdorff, to x infinity, d infinity, m infinity, t infinity, if and only if all embed isometrically into the same space. And um, the image of MJ under the J isometric embedding converges to M infinity, the image of M infinity under the infinity isometric embedding against continuous bounded test functions of bounded support. We don't talk about compact support anymore because these spaces are not locally compact necessarily. Um, and of course we want ij of pj to be i infinity of p infinity for every j. And with this notion of convergence, you have uh, natural compactness notions and you also have stability. Um, this implies stability of CD entropic K infinity without boundedly compact. And so somehow this seems to me like the natural notion, it's a little bit simpler too. Um, so I'm not, I don't ask for X, J, D, J to be Gromov Hausdorff converging to X infinity, D infinity. I only ask for these measures to be converging to those measures in this weak sense. And I ask, I ask that there, there be these isometric embeddings. So the, the geometry does matter because I need these isometric embeddings. But I, beyond that, I don't ask for Gromov Hausdorff convergence uh, a priori. And, um, and so anyhow, that seems to me the natural notion. And it's automatically, it, in, in, with this notion of isometry, we ought, with this notion of isometry, we automatically have that x2, d2, whatever is isometric to the support of m2, d2, m2, p2. So I, with this notion of is, isometry classes, I never see points in x2 that are not in the support of m2. And so that somehow seems to fit nicely with the, my statement of the preceding theorems where I only had these results when the limiting space uh, agreed with the support of the limiting measure. Okay, questions, problems, difficulties? Um, all right, so if not, uh, we have pretty much at the end of my hour, maybe even a little overtime, depending on how you count. Uh, and I guess I will see you on, I'll, I'll transition to office hours first, but uh, 